can remember having a crush on my first librarian, Kathleen Lucking was her name, and she um, would always help me out. I grew up with a, an old grandfather and um, his son, my uncle, and um, the housekeeper. And I used to um, go to the library every Wednesday night and get books for all of us. And uh, Miss Looking used to help me with the books until I got to run the place myself. And then I kind of lived in that library and uh, it opened my mind to the outside world. So I've written a number of books. Some of you will know me through Black 47. Uh, one of the things about being in Black 47 and being in any kind of a rock and roll band that's touring is that there's an awful lot of downtime. And um, I used to use that, uh, especially in the years after I got a laptop, uh, because, you know, when you're traveling, it, it's great in one way, but it's a lot of time to fill. And I found that I could drive to Albany or the, the band could drive to Albany. It was about two, two and a half hours from New York City. And, uh, you know, I could get a lot of work done at that point. And then uh, if we were staying in a hotel that night, I'd uh, go out partying with everyone, but I would set the alarm for around six in the morning and get up and write again. So I was always writing a book or a play, whatever. Uh, this particular book means a lot to me. Um, I guess it means it would mean a lot to, if they read it, to anyone who was around New York in those days uh, around 9-11. But let me give you a little plot of the story first. It's about um, the Murphy family from uh, Rockaway, Queens. Now, Rockaway is on a peninsula uh, right on the border of Queens. And then in your backyard is the Atlantic. So it was a, it was a great place. I always loved going there. And from the minute I arrived from Ireland, I heard about it. And I would take the A train out there from where I lived in the Lower East Side on Sunday afternoons. So I became really familiar with the place in the years that I spent in New York City. Anyway, it's kind of a police family. The uh, father is Detective Sergeant Jimmy Murphy, who had been a Vietnam vet or was a Vietnam vet and uh, had some problems over there that he still had in later in life. His wife was a school teacher, Maggie. She's a Catholic school teacher, an English teacher. The eldest son was Brian, who is a, a super achiever. He goes to Regis High School, which is a hard school to get into because it's free. It's a Catholic school and they get the, the best kids or the um, smartest or best at exam kids from all over the city. And then he went to Georgetown and was top of the class there. And to everyone's amazement, he joins the cops because he could have become a lawyer. He could have written his ticket down on Wall Street, uh, but he becomes a cop and he becomes a kind of a super cop. He passes by his father. And by the time he's 30, he's the youngest lieutenant in the city. And um, then there's the younger son who kind of lives in Brian's shadow. His name is Kevin. And then there's Kevin or Brian's wife, Rose. So it's a, a full family and everything was going pretty well until 9-11. And Brian, after rescuing seven people, runs back into the tower and then the tower collapses on him. And the whole family, of course, takes this really badly. And after about two years, they're beginning to come to terms with it. Particularly Maggie, uh, the mother, uh, she had this bond with her son. They were both avid readers. And one of their games was that they would quote a passage from something, usually a passage of poetry, and then the other one would have to guess what it was. Uh, so she was devastated by this, but she's starting to come back. When? 
Detective Sergeant Jimmy Murphy finds out that Brian was actually in the North Tower 30 minutes before the plane crashed into it. And his antenna instantly goes up. What was Brian doing there? In fact, he says, what the hell was he doing there? Um, no one will give him a proper answer. So he sets out to find out himself and the path leads him back to an old friend of his, Yosef Ibrahim, an Egyptian American uh, owner of falafel partners. And eventually the trail leads to um, his, to Yosef's youngest daughter, um, or his, yes, his youngest daughter, uh, Fatima. So that's in a nutshell what the story is about. Why did I write it? Well, I live about 10 blocks from the uh, World Trades and I'm a Mets baseball fan. And uh, I remember that morning I was studying the box scores and I was down like that when I heard the plane coming and oh my God, it came so low, I was sure it was gonna crash into our building. And I actually jammed my head down onto the New York Times and kept it there for a second or two. And then I heard this thud. It was like sledgehammer hitting concrete. And I raced up into the roof and there was the most amazing sight because I had a clear view. It was a plane stuck in the tower had gone right into it. And it was clouds of smoke coming out of it and tongues of flame licking out from it. Spars and debris were falling and lots of other things that I, was, I didn't want to put a name on it um, were coming down. I actually went down after the second plane hit, which I didn't see because that's coming from the south and I was looking down south. So that crashed into the sock tower. And um, so I got down about six blocks down Broadway and I had to stop because the smoke and the air was just, it's hard to describe what it was like. It was just so thick. So I came back up. But my real experience that led to writing the book was Black 47, that's the band I was in, was the house band of New York City. So we had, um, we had been on the road, but we had a regular uh, gig when any Saturday we were in town at Connolly's on 45th Street. So we knew that we had to get people back into the city. Remember, nobody was in, coming into the city at that point. Everyone was afraid there was going to be another attack. And... Uh, so we put out the word and some of our fans showed up, but the word really got out to first responders that there was actually a place to go to on Saturday nights and Black 47 was gonna be there playing. And those gigs, we did, about, oh, we did about three or four months of them before we started playing out around the country again, maybe about six months actually. Um, but the first, three or four are still burned in my head. Not so much even for the music, the music was intense. Everything about the gig was super intense, but something would happen. You see, we didn't know who was alive. We knew certain people were dead. We didn't know who was alive and first responders there didn't know either. Um, the lists hadn't been prepared yet. And whenever the door, this is on the third floor, would open, um, everyone would look over and it'd be, oh my God, John is alive, or oh my God, Joan is alive, you know? And everybody would rush over and bear hugs. It was like, you're alive, you're alive. And after seeing that so many times in the first three or four weeks, I made a vow that I was gonna tell the story of John and Joan, the story of the regular people of New York City, not the politicians who were lining up to get their photos taken, or the media hounds who just wanted to be associated with it, but the people 
who had taken the brunt of this. And um, Black 47 did an album called New York Town a couple of years after it. And that was the two or three years before the, it was dedicated to the two or three years before uh, the attack and to the two or three years after it. Because to my mind, New York is still split. There's the period of my life anyway, uh, that's pre 9-11 and there's the period that's post 9-11. And I thought that would kind of, would tell the story, but it didn't. And uh, so I'm a playwright and then for the next three or four years after um, the New York Town album, I wrote a play called The Heart Has a Mind of Its Own. And it was pretty good. But I remember on opening night, watching it and thinking, man, I have failed so badly because this was a kitchen sink drama and it didn't capture the magnitude of 9-11. It was, and it definitely didn't capture the story of John and Joan as I wanted to tell it. But what I did have was I had created the Murphy family and the characters I've just told you about. Uh, so I let it be for another couple of years, but the characters are still rattling around in my head. It was like they were trying to get out. And finally I said, all right, all right, I'll write it. Anyway, I, um, after about 2018, uh, I remember thinking, you know, I could handle this again. And I told the story on my show, um, Celtic Crush on Sirius XM. I got a call from, the head of Cornell University Press. He said, send it to me. And I sent it to him and he said, I'll publish it. We just need to do some work on it. And that's what I was doing up until about four or five months ago. And now the book is done. And I, I feel like I kind of, I got what I wanted to, to do in it. I wanted to tell the story of John and Joan through the eyes of the Murphy family from Rockaway Beach in Queens. So I'll read you a little bit of the, the book and then we'll uh, get to the interesting part, your questions. This is, um, I'll begin at the beginning. That first deep draft of salt sea air always cleared his head. Sometimes he even trekked down to the water's edge and played chicken with the surf and spray, despite Maggie's insistence that the salt corroded his black leather shoes and that he was mad as a hatter not to wear sneakers like everyone else. Jimmy had never cared for sneakers. He felt that took the dignity away from a man and of late, there was little else holding them together. More often than not, he just leaned over the railing on the Rockaway boardwalk and gazed out at the breakers. He didn't need to be that close to the ocean anymore. It was bone deep inside him. Even halfway around the world, when he was crawling on his gut up near the DMZ, sucking in the tang of jungle decay and the reek of Willie Pete, he could sink his face in memories of Rockaway surf and know that whatever happened to anyone else, Jimmy Murphy was gonna make it home alive from Vietnam. And in the bad old days of the 70s, when still a rookie cop, he often stood on the self same boardwalk spot and watched the sun rise up out of the Atlantic. And in those jittery dawns, he could feel the first gentle rays burn away all the residual bullshit of the insomniac city. Jimmy never tired of his boardwalk ritual. It always grounded him, for he had the ocean's vastness, hardly more than a stone's throw away from his kitchen. That set him and the, the peninsula apart. But the Rockaway Peninsula was narrow in more ways than one. And from time to time, Jimmy chafed against the resultant insularity. 
But it was the only home he'd ever known. And no matter where he dallied, he always returned to his concrete strip of heaven that perched warily by the side of the unpredictable Atlantic. Next parish, Ireland, Jimmy. He hadn't heard Artie creep up behind him, but he did catch the note of triumph. The old man had pulled a number on Detective Sergeant James Murphy, 30-year veteran of the NYPD. Yeah, Artie, just beyond the horizon. Jimmy acknowledged the small victory. Even as he studied, Artie's grizzled face. How's Maggie? Artie asked. She's fine, Artie. Just fine, babe. For the next, for the first year or two, that question had set him on edge. Even coming from a harmless old beach bum. But on this May Day, 2004, almost three years later, Things weren't near as bad. The truth be told, Maggie had caused a sensation, bawling her head off on the boardwalk when everyone else was taking their lumps and sucking it up after the big bang. Mrs. Maggie Murphy, of all people, the English teacher at Stella Mar Maris, always a together one, well-dressed, just the right hint of makeup would have expected it. The whole beach felt bad for the Murphys. They were good people, always there for everyone else. So his wife has cut some slack. And yet, the question, as Maggie, still set Jimmy on edge and flung him right back to that brutal September morning almost three years before. The dust had been suffocating, but Jimmy had found a working phone some blocks from the North Tower and called Maggie to say Kevin was safe. Someone had seen Kevin up around Canal Street evacuating residents with his fire crew. I know, he called and told me he was okay. Well, where's Brian? Where's Brian? Maggie had kept repeating as the line crackled, cutting in and out. I don't know. Call Rose, she'll know. He didn't come home last night. Rose has no idea where he is. But Jimmy's anger spiked at another of his son's unexplained absences. He rattled off some crap about Brian going to DC on Giuliani business before hanging up. But it was the same story, no matter where he inquired. Cops and fire missing big time. Gotta wait till the dust settles. Back near the North Plaza, Jimmy ran into Sergeant Noah Jensen from Midtown North, who said he was pretty sure Brian was off duty. But Jimmy knew he had to be nearby. Brian was always at the center of things. Why would this be any different? Jimmy tensed, as did Jensen, as the ground began to shake under them and they ran when they heard the same monstrous groan the South Tower had given. Jensen sprinted ahead, but when he turned back to look, Jimmy could see his eyes almost bulge from their sockets. Jimmy spun round just as the huge antenna sank into the collapsing roof 110 stories up. And the North Tower trembled before it tumbled methodically down, sending a wind howling across the plaza and through the canyons of lower Manhattan. Jimmy surrendered to it and ran through the clouds of dust. But the gathering gray hurricane sent him staggering over a sidewalk curb. He picked himself up and stumbled on again, his arms outstretched in the viscous semi-darkness until he hit a window frame. He stood to a halt, his forehead grazing against glass. He had no idea where he was, but he had gained some kind of shelter, for the force of the wind lessened. He covered his nose and mouth, 
and held on for dear life. The overwhelming din of sparse, clattering steel, bending and concrete collapsing rose in a crescendo, then faded very slowly until a dense, eerie silence blanketed everything like the morning after a blizzard. Jimmy stayed in the doorway, scared out of his wits to move or even turn around. Finally, when the smoke and choking filth had thinned somewhat, he warily inched out into a big, dusty, plowed up graveyard, where once two gleaming towers preened, boasting of their strength and permanence, now only a couple of gaping walls stood. The glass from their cathedral-like windows pulverized and floating about in the poisonous powdery grime. Men were already clawing at twisted steel beams, slabs of rock and mountains of rubble, and everywhere a smell like kerosene from the thousands of gallons of jet fuel. Clouds smoke and dust were ebbing and flowing against a steady confetti-like hail of paper, all illuminated by ghostly fires, and it was hard to see for minutes on end. But occasionally the wind would shift, and it would clear for a few seconds. Then, with the sun burning through the haze, he saw a Port Authority sergeant that Brian used to hang with and the two of them were kids back at Regis. The sergeant said he'd seen Brian with Richie Sullivan inside the North Tower, and they had plenty of time to get out. What does that prove? Jimmy said. And where's Sullivan? Where do you think? The sergeant lifted an imaginary drink to his mouth. But Jimmy, he knew exactly where Sullivan would be. And he found his old partner in Kelly's of Cedar Street. The bartender was locking up, dumping envelopes stuffed with cash in a backpack. Sullivan was already half gone from the shock and a pint glass of whiskey. Jimmy shook the large disheveled frame of his old partner as the white dust arose in plumes around them. It took a while. But through all the crying and slobbering, he made out that Brian had led seven people out of the North Tower, raced back in for more, and then the whole show came tumbling down on top of him. And Jimmy was screaming that the son of a bitch was lying, but Sullivan just kept bawling back that he'd been with Brian since 8.15 that morning and knew exactly what happened. Finally, Jimmy threw him over a table and bolted out the door. Jimmy pulled rank and got a lift out to Rockaway. He barged through his front door on 120th Street, nearly taking it off the hinges, but all was silent within. Maggie already knew. No one had told her. She just knew. She was up in their bedroom. The blinds were drawn against the clear blue September day. And then shadowy hush. She was sitting on the side of the bed, staring at the wall. Her fists clenched. Her slim body taut. She didn't say anything. Not a word. Nor did he speak to her. The room was so quiet. It was like the birds would never sing again. The tears and the acres of loneliness, they'd all come later. But at that moment, Jimmy Murphy prayed to God. He'd never hear silence. I like that again. Thank you.
I think you're you're muted. <laughs> I am muted. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That was, that was wonderful, Larry. Thank you so much. Peace always brings me back to it. In fact, at one point I was reading it there and I realized that I hadn't been concentrating on the last six or seven lines of all. I was back there and I got a shock. Oh my God. I hope I haven't stopped reading. <laughs> no, so, and I'm, I'm seeing comments like, wow. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Well, it's my pleasure. Does you anyone know, have I, any questions or, you know, or any thoughts about it? I'm, I know in New York, people sometimes tend to get proprietorial about the whole thing, but it was an event that shook the world. And, uh, so it's, it's the world's affair. But if I can elucidate anything about the day or about the book or any question or about my life before the book with Black 47 or whatever, I'm open.